Well, hello and welcome everybody. I'm Ryan Evans with the Center for Agricultural Profitability at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And we want to thank you for joining us today for another webinar in our series that, as many of you know, typically happens every Thursday at noon central time, right where we are now. And as always, you can register for upcoming webinars and check out past recordings on our Center for Ag Profitability's website at cap.unl.edu slash webinars. President Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act on August 16th, and today our webinar will explore some major provisions of this act, including those for climate and energy and those that may affect agriculture here in Nebraska. To present, we have two experts who are with the Center for Agricultural Profitability. Dave Aiken is a professor and water law and ag law specialist. Hi, Dave. Hey, Ryan. And uh, also we are joined by Brad Lubin, an agricultural policy specialist with the center. Hi, Brad. Ryan, good day. So as Dave and Brad are presenting today and uh, you have questions, please do type those into the Q&A box or the chat box on your Zoom platform. And we'll have some time at the end of the presentation to answer those. So thanks again for joining us. And Dave, we'll turn it over to you to get started. Thank you, Ryan. Does it look good? Looks great. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we're talking about the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, and we're talking about it because it's uh, the first major federal law that has been enacted that addresses climate change, and uh, so it's a it's a it, it's a real uh, turning point in climate policy in the United States, because we really haven't had a national climate policy before now. But uh, the bill does not take the regulatory approach, uh, which is how these laws tend to be formed. Uh, but you know that hasn't worked. And so they've gone to a, a big increase in uh, tax credits for clean energy development and production, uh, broadly defined, so that includes things like carbon capture uh, and storage and also nuclear power. Uh, and then there's a raft of uh, consumer clean energy tax credits uh, that we won't get into uh, today. But we'll take a look at the kind of the clean electricity program and how uh, it might uh, uh, help us begin to do something in the United States at the national level uh, for climate change. The United States is number one in terms of the amount of greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere. Uh, there's more from the United States than any place else. We'll see a chart on that in just a second. Uh, Europe is two, uh, and I forget who's three after that. Uh, in terms of annual emissions, we were number one for a long time. Uh, now uh, we're number two behind China, uh, but it'll be, I don't know, I tried to figure it out once, at least 40 years before uh, China uh, overtakes us uh, or potentially could overtake us in terms of cumulative emissions, you know, where we have a, where we have a pretty big lead. Um, the United States has been absent uh, in the global climate policy uh, development uh, going back to the 1992 Kyoto Climate Agreement. And uh, you know, Europe clearly has had the most, has done the most in terms of trying to deal with climate change. Uh, China uh, as an emerging uh, economy uh, has done uh, more and arguably more than we have in the United States as a fully developed economy. Uh, any progress that we have made in the United States uh, on climate change has come from uh, state clean energy policies, which of course we don't have here in Nebraska. Uh, Iowa does, uh, Colorado does, uh, but not all of our neighbors do. Uh, federal uh, clean energy tax credits that, that go back quite a ways, uh, 
uh, and have, have helped a lot in terms of solar and uh, wind uh, energy development. And then uh, state and federal energy efficiency requirements, you know, for things like uh, uh, equipment, uh, appliances, stuff like that. Okay, and here's our chart uh, that shows cumulative emissions and the United States is number one, Europe is two, uh, Russia is three, interestingly enough. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, um, you know, so we arguably are more responsible for climate change than any other country. Uh, we don't hear that very often, but it's certainly true. Uh, here's annual emitters. Uh, and you know China's one, and we're number two, and then Europe is number three. But uh, you know, we really, as the leading cause of climate change, uh, we have kind of been missing from the fight uh, until uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, was was enacted uh, just within the last month. No Republican uh, support. Uh, our very fractured political system in Congress uh, has, has made action on a lot of major issues uh, difficult. Uh, certainly, uh, we've see, we see that with uh, immigration debates that are going on today and stuff like that. But climate is another issue that has been a victim of that. Uh, and the Inflation Reduction Act, and I call it by abbreviated the IR Act so that you don't get confused with you know, your IRA retirement fund, uh, retirement uh, programs. Um, it uses, you know, subsidies, these tax credits instead of regulations uh, to, to try to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. And this is why I don't think it will have much of a boost in terms of uh, the, the ag carbon markets. Uh, again, that's another webinar perhaps, but uh, it's, if, it, if we were regulated carbon emissions, then uh, these voluntary carbon markets would get a real boost, but we won't be doing that, so at least at the national level, so it's not much of an impact on them. The uh, Obama Clean Power Plan, which uh, goes back uh, to uh, 2015, and actually, Obama efforts to try to deal, you know, to try to get uh, this carbon cap and trade program adopted was originally introduced in 2009, but it didn't, it didn't get out of, it didn't, wasn't adopted by Congress. So passed the House, but not the Senate. And so they, the Obama administration said, it's okay, well, we're going to do it under the Clean Air Act. Uh, and that proposal, the Clean Power Plan, is, is recently invalidated by the Supreme Court. So that one is kind of, uh, won't, won't have any impact either uh, without, again, uh, major uh, legislative changes. But the big thing that it does for our discussion today is that it uh, increases uh, clean uh, energy tax credits from around a billion dollars a year uh, to $11 billion a year through uh, 2031. And so, uh, people expect a big, you know, once this thing gets up and running, and that takes a little while, of course, but once this thing gets up and running, uh, this program gets up and running, uh, there's, they expect a lot more uh, uh, wind uh, energy, uh, new wind facilities, new solar facilities, uh, you know, offshore wind, uh, all this kind of stuff. Um, and the share of electricity uh, that comes from uh, these clean energy sources is projected to increase from uh, current 24% uh, to 80%, uh, you know, 75%, 80, 85%, something like that by the year 2030. And so that that's uh, that's a pretty aggressive expectation, but that's, you know, that's a huge change in terms of electricity generation uh, in the United States. Okay, so how, how will this, you know, what's, what's the strategy here? Uh, basically, step one is to clean up emissions from the electricity sector. And then when they get pretty clean, uh, where it's, you know, where it's not gonna be 100% for a long time, but if it gets close to that 
that 80% or something like that, then uh, you know we can uh, try to push uh, the uh, um, EVs and other electric vehicles uh, because the electricity that will recharge those EVs will be pretty clean, not based on coal or uh, petroleum or natural gas uh, usually, but you know on, on these cleaner cleaner forms of energy. Um, of course, if most of our cars are going to be running our in a, you know, our, our smaller trucks are, are going to be running on uh, electricity, we're going to need to generate a lot more than we do now. And uh, some folks think that we may generate we may double our electricity capacity in the United States by 2030 or 2035, uh, and and then increase it even more by 2050. So we're talking about a lot more electricity being consumed and you know less gasoline consumption and all that. So, but electrifying the transportation sector, we're getting as much of it as you can, you know, would be the step two. And then step three is doing stuff like uh, replacing natural gas heating with uh, electric heat pumps uh, and you know, trying to reduce uh, natural gas you know, consumption in the different sectors of the economy uh, where, that's, where that's really feasible. And this, the new act uh, makes it more likely that we'll be able to uh, uh, accomplish the president's goals uh, for, clean, for clean electricity and, and all the way 2050 uh, net zero emissions. Um, internationally, this is a big deal because for the first time, uh, since going back to the Kyoto Climate Agreement in 1992, when this kind of kicked off as an, inter, as an important international issue, the United States at the national level was finally doing something to try to uh, reduce, significantly reduce greenhouse uh, uh, emissions in the United States. And, you know, European Union is ahead of us. Uh, uh, they're going to keep, they're going to keep doing what they've already done. Uh, it will be uh, the big thing is you know China is is a major factor in terms of how are, how do we reduce greenhouse gas emissions globally, uh, and with us doing something, finally it's going to be harder for them to uh, to cheat or try to get out of their their climate emissions. Uh, so that's positive, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that has to actually happen in the next 10, 15 years, start to see some reduction in terms of the increase of, of emissions and then hopefully the flattening out and even the reduction of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and even if all of this comes to pass, we've still uh, baked a lot of climate change, a lot of extreme weather uh, it has already been baked into the global climate system. So. Uh, we're going to, you know, extreme weather is going to get worse uh, before it gets better, and I don't have a whole lot of good news on that on that score. Okay, now there's a a lot of people say we need to have 100% clean electricity. Well, that's really not feasible today. Uh, it may not be that feasible five or ten years from now. We'll we'll see how things play out, but. Uh, the people who say that are assuming that we'll make, that we will maintain uh, reliability in the in the uh, electricity grid. That means that you know when everybody flips on, excuse me, uh, flips on the light switch, the lights will come on uh, the way they're supposed to, right? Uh, but if we went to 100% wind and solar, that would be very problematic uh, because you know. Wind is gen wind generates electricity when there's when the wind's blowing, uh, but it's not blowing all the time. Uh, we know solar only generates when there's good sunshine, and uh, you know the sun isn't shining all the time. Uh, these things, uh, both of these sources, are not reliable on a 24 hours a day, seven days a week type of system. So we're going to need a lot of stuff that we don't have now. We're going to need battery storage. Uh, we're going to need more natural, more 
electricity generation from natural gas, which many clean energy activists are trying to shut down. Uh, we'll need clean coal, uh, and I have that in, in quotes, but you know, there's a lot of money in, in the new law, the climate law for uh, to push ahead with better technology for uh, carbon capture uh, and underground storage, uh, which would help coal plants, not just in the United States, but in India and in China. You know, so it's a technology that we really need to get good at. Uh, we're gonna bring emissions down globally as well as you know, keep them, try to bring them down in the US. Uh, and nuclear power, you know, we're looking at, at smaller uh, nuclear power plants uh, to, to be available also in terms of electricity generation. And so, you know, there are things that, you know, these things and more are all gonna need to get ready for prime time uh, before we have, uh, you know, before we can uh, have more and more wind and solar uh, and other uh, intermittent types of uh, clean generation in the grid uh, and still keep the lights on uh, all the time. The uh, issue that we have with natural gas, I mean, we've got plenty of natural gas, uh, but the problem is, is that in the wintertime, the first claim on natural gas is for heating and uh, natural, and so electricity generation kind of gets what's left over after all the heating uh, uh, demand for natural gas is, is, is taken care of. So there, you know, we may not have enough natural gas in the sump in the winter uh, when it gets really cold, and so that that's that's an issue that we have with natural gas. But you know, fortunately, the uh, uh, grid professionals, both in the public sector and the private sector, are very much aware of this, and are you know, it's it's tops on their list of things to do aside from you know, security from hackers and stuff like that. So. So uh, hopefully we'll get there uh, where we need to be. Okay, this is just a slide that I came across yesterday from the National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, and it, you know, it talks about climate change in Nebraska. And this shows projections in terms of temperature increases uh, in Nebraska and the, the projected ones. And the blue one is if we if we do lower emissions, and maybe we will. And the red one is if we don't, you know, hit our clean energy targets uh, the way we hope we will. And, and in, in terms of, you know, one of the clearest manifestations of global warming is extreme weather. And again, we we could do a, a, a separate talk on that, but you know looking at the recent and current extreme weather. Uh, you know, we've had the, the bad floods in 2011, uh, and this was historic uh, on the, the, the Missouri River. Uh, then the 2019 flood on the Platte, uh, uh, Blue, and Elkhorn, uh, that was also a historic flood uh, that, you know, magnitude we've never seen before. And then the 2012 drought, uh, which is you know, some of the worst heat that we've ever experienced in Nebraska. We have the mega drought that's been going on for 20 years uh, in the southwestern part of the United States. Uh, and uh, as, as that drought persists and isn't broken in any significant way by more precipitation, uh, more and more uh, scientists are saying this may be the new normal in the western United States. It just may be like this all the time. Uh, we've had, you know, a couple, along with the drought, you know, we've had all these Western wildfires again over the last 20 years. You know, it's been a big deal in California, but it's been a, a significant in other states as well. This year, we've had some uh, unusual wildfires uh, in the United States, in the Eastern United States, and in Europe. Uh, you know, the past few years, we've had. Uh, some wildfires in Nebraska. Fortunately, nothing as bad as they have, uh, as they've had in, in, in California. But, but you know, it's something that has not been happening that much in Nebraska. Uh, you know, we had the, uh, 
uh, what I call the catastrophic uh, Texas grid blackout in 2021, you know, where a lot of people died uh, trying to keep warm. Uh, and it's a lot of that was mismanagement of the, of the grid in Texas. Uh, but that, you know, the cold weather that drove that, you know, it, it affected the whole central United States, not just Texas. It's just that Texas had the worst management system for their electricity grid, and so they paid the price. Um, flooding this year in Yellowstone, uh, you know, uh, the highways being washed away, uh, extreme heat and drought in Europe, uh, you know, horrible flooding in West Virginia, uh, bad, bad flooding in Houston. Um, a study says that uh, the melting of the uh, ice in, in uh, Greenland uh, could raise sea level uh, up to 10 inches in coming decades. Uh, flooding in Pakistan, uh, we, don't, we all have seen on TV what's happening in Hurricane Fiona in the, in the Caribbean. Uh, and then this last one is kind of interesting. Uh, this comes from uh, uh, Farmers Mutual Insurance Company. And uh, basically they're saying that the storm season in Nebraska is, is 75 days longer uh, than it is in the, than it was in the past. Okay, uh, in 2014, uh, Don Wilhite, uh, who was the, at that time the head of the Climate Center at the university, uh, led a team that looked at uh, what federal uh, reports, climate studies were saying about you know, the climate in Nebraska. And basically going from, we're going from a few days to maybe a week and a half of days over hundred degrees each year. Uh, we're gonna go from there to uh, three to four to five weeks every year. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of, to me, that's, that's kind of startling, that's kind of scary. Um, the, the one little bit of good news is that if we do better on controlling emissions globally, uh, those increases in terms of the very hot days could go from three to five weeks to, uh, uh two to four weeks. So, you know, that would knock about a week off of what would happen, uh, in the next couple of decades. But that's, you know, and this would be comparable to what we experienced in 2012, those of you who can remember, uh, remember that year. Uh, also, hot nights, uh, and this, 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 uh, the the map on the right shows the increase in the number of of uh, nights over 70, where the overnight low is 70 degrees or more, uh, and so we're seeing uh, 25 to uh, 40 days of that uh, uh, in Nebraska as well. Okay, sorry. My mouse is fighting with me. Uh, you know, how are we going to deal with this? Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, with geotechnology, some of this kind of Buck Rogers stuff, uh, hopefully we can get some of that online. Um, here's a direct capture facility that they have in uh, somewhere in, in Sweden or Norway. Uh, anyway, it, it sucks the air in. And then removes the carbon, and then you know, blows the cleaner air out the other side. Uh, you know, very expensive, but if it, uh, it's, it may be uh, a possibility. And then here's the Tesla uh, battery, and uh, you know, energy storage, electricity storage in these batteries uh, will be key. But uh, you know, we have to have an awful lot of them uh, to make a whole lot of difference. Okay, that is it for me, and uh, I will turn it back to you, Ryan. All right, thank you, Dave. And as Brad is preparing his presentation here, just want to remind you, if you have questions as uh, we are going here, please do put those into the Q&A box or the chat box on your screen, and uh, Dave and Brad will work to answer those here toward the end of the hour once Brad is done with his presentation. I um, also have a quick uh, survey to put in here at the end of the 
webinar, if you don't mind clicking on that to provide your evaluation. So watch the chat box for that. But uh, Brad, if you're ready to take it away, it's all yours now. Ryan, thank you very much. Uh, ready to go. And I hope uh, you're seeing a screen, uh, my cover slide here. So looks good. good go. All right. Thank you. So I appreciate the sort of the, the entreaty that Dave started here with the discussion of climate issues and and my take here will be more specifically responsive. What do we see in the recent legislation as it relates to agricultural uh, practices, conservation practices, and, and climate? And we'll get a sense of what the bill offers, as well as a few bigger questions. And so I do want to start with a, a bigger question. Uh, if we think about conservation policy and environmental policy in general, uh, think about the spectrum from sort of direct government intervention or government regulatory activity to market-driven activity. And uh, sort of as Dave noted, you could break this down and, and do a webinar or do a major effort on every one of these components, but we have the regulatory arena, uh, the executive branch uh, regulatory actions um, with uh, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, EPA's broad jurisdiction, jurisdiction et cetera. Uh, we also have within farm policy, conservation compliance, compliance rules that are not regulatory mandates, but they are requirements of producers that participate in farm programs. So conservation compliance on highly erodible land, as well as the wetlands uh, uh, conservation programs commonly called swamp buster and the sod buster programs, the conservation on, um, on longstanding uh, native grass or, or native uh, cover. So we have compliance programs that affect things like farm program participation, crop insurance participation, uh, other conservation program participation and other USDA programs as well. So that's sort of a step away from direct regulation to compliancy uh, with uh, regulations as a prerequisite to participation in programs. We then have the direct incentive programs, which we've seen really adopt and grow over the last uh, uh, 30 plus years um, with land retirement programs like the Conservation Reserve Program, as well as the Working Lands Programs that we commonly think Environmental Quality Incentives Program, Conservation Stewardship Program, for example. Land preservation comes in there as well, the, the easement programs, uh, the new partnership programs, the, the regional conservation partnership programs, and USDA's uh, various technical assistance as well. Those are all in the incentive category of providing assistance providing uh, cost share or incentive payments to producers to adopt targeted uh, priority conservation practices. And then at the right there, I demonstrate, think about what the market is telling us and what the market is offering. There are carbon and nutrient and water quality type markets available today where producers can trade credits into a market um, that is based on a buyer. Now, to the extent that those markets are voluntary, and those are willing buyers coming forward to, for example, purchase carbon credits from producers uh, or from an intermediary, most likely. But those are voluntary buyers that are doing so to offset their uh, personal emissions or their uh, corporate emissions or to, uh, to, to push towards some targeted stewardship protocol that they're pushing. So I offer the supply chain in there as another example. It's a market driven phenomenon. It may not be a market transaction but it might be that the end user, end user is demanding various steps, various practices of its supply chain, backing all the way up to uh, the producer. So if we think about these broad practices, think about them coming from sort of multiple avenues here. And I draw this as a line, but you could argue it's a, a circle because on the market, some of those market opportunities for credits might in fact be driven by regulatory markets. As Dave noted, we don't have a federal cap and trade program for carbon, much as was discussed in legislation more than a decade ago or in the Obama era administration proposals. Um, but we do have two markets out there, a, a California market and a New England market. So there are some relatively smaller regulatory market driven or regulatory driven market opportunities. And then we also have the proposed regulation and some uncertainty of what the Securities and Exchange Commission is asking corporations, public corporations, to report in the form of ESG reporting, environmental, social, and governance issues. And to the extent that that reports 
uh, against greenhouse gas emissions, will that back up through the supply chain all the way to producers as well? That's, that's sort of the full circle on the types of approaches that we might consider here. If we think about the incentive approaches that we've seen, they have grown dramatically in the last uh, 30 years plus. Uh, first with the Conservation Reserve Program and the 85 Farm Bill, and then really since the 2000s with growth, particularly in working lands programs like EQIP and CSP. So much so that the long-term trend has been growth in funding and a shift toward more and more working lands programs, particularly EQIP and CSP. CRP is still fundamentally a substantial year-to-year uh, -year component of conservation spending and, and payments to producers, but EQIP and CSP have gained substantial ground in terms of total payments and share of the total here. Now, that's sort of the baseline of where we've started and where we were going prior to uh, this year's Inflation Reduction Act. The Inflation Reduction Act itself adds substantial new funding, uh, new funding authority over the next four years, really to be spent over the next nine or so. And even since the IRA Act, uh, we have uh, an administration announcement of nearly $3 billion in uh, partnerships uh, and funding commitments for projects focused on climate smart commodities or climate smart uh, practices. So substantial new funding, uh, even beyond just the IRA. Now, I wanted to note this background for conservation, and I do put up a slide here for the Conservation Reserve Program, just to remind us that even our traditional conservation programs that we seem to be familiar with have changed over time as well. In the CRP, we have been growing acres in a category called continuous enrollment, which tends to be for much more targeted conservation practices. And in the last three to four years, particularly we've grown enrollment in something called the Grasslands Initiative, which has a, a payment for grasslands that remain in production, but are managed uh, for conservation benefits. So even the CRP is becoming more of a working lands type uh, program, uh, particularly with some of the general CRP uh, that's still there, um, also having managed hay and grazing provisions as well. That's to, to tell us that even in that portfolio of land retirement, there's working lands components of, of that program as well. So I'm focusing more and more, uh, the, the interest is more and more on what working lands programs look like and what kind of opportunities producers may see. We think about what the IRA did uh, here or proposes to do as it was passed in August uh, for the EQIP program. Just compare it to roughly $20 billion in budget authority over the next 10 years. That's the 10-year budget baseline as scored by the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, the IRA itself adds more than $8 billion of additional funding authority. Uh, officially over the next four years, but ultimately to be uh, allocated or to, or to be spent over the next uh, nine. The focus uh, for EQIP funding includes ruminant diet and feed management practices, really to reduce enteric fermentation, soil carbon practices, reduce nitrogen, so nutrient management practices, and reducing, capturing, avoiding, or sequestering carbon, methane, and nitrous oxide emissions. So, Broadly speaking, uh, emissions uh, reduction capture control processes as well. CSP similar, similarly has a budget of about 10 billion over the next 10 years, and in addition here in the IRA Act of more than 3 billion. So substantial increase in, in CSP funding as well with the same sorts of practices, not specifically the ruminant uh, practices, which might be covered under cost share uh, elements of EQIP, but the rest of these stewardship practices there certainly as well. So dramatic increases in EQIP, dramatic increases in CSP uh, over the coming years. ACEP is the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. Uh, for those who remember old acronyms and old language, we used to have something called the Wetlands Reserve, uh, the Farm and Ranch Land Protection Program, and the Grasslands Reserve. All of those had easement type uh, tools within them all of the easements uh, were accumulated in the ASEP program in the 2014 Farm Bill. Relative to the others, it's a much smaller component, but at 4.5 billion in authority over 10 years and an addition of, of 1.4, uh, we're talking about a substantial jump here as well. 
this focus on on easements so it's not just practices it's it's trying to preserve land that helps uh, uh, address these these specific uh, uh, you know conservation and, and climate priorities uh, the RCPP uh, the RCPP is the Regional Conservation Partnership Program uh, budget authority of about three billion with more than that added over uh, in new budget authority as per the IRA. So substantial increases in RCPP. Uh, RCPP itself is not specifically a different approach to conservation practices. It utilizes the same sort of working lands tools and, and incentives uh, and the easement uh, tools of ASAP, but it does so in partnership with local sponsors uh, to help uh, uh, leverage both federal and uh, state and local dollars. And it does so to um, uh, to address locally identified priorities. So it's a different approach to essentially using the same kinds of tools. Now, those are the four elements specifically that are funded uh, with substantial increases in the IRA, in the agricultural section. If I sum those up, think about where we've been uh, over the last uh, uh, almost 15 years here. Um, we had funding for EQIP, CSP, uh, ASAP and RCPP and its predecessors. Um, so there have been chain, title changes, acronym changes over time, but funding for these programs and their predecessors. Uh, from less than $2 billion to a, uh, a target today of around $4 billion. IRA adds another 17 to $18 billion of authority over the next four years. That doesn't get spent over the next four years. So read the line in that graph and actual spending ramps up toward uh, approximately 7 billion a year before it comes back down and expires after 2031. That's partly the rule of the, uh, um, the budgeting process and the IRA. Uh, it could not commit expenditures beyond uh, the end of the, uh, uh, the 10 year uh, budget horizon. It's a reconciliation bill and couldn't do that. So it uh, so it's forced to uh, essentially come back to baseline by the year 2032. But we can suffice it to say, these are dramatic increases in proposed spending and assistance for new practices or new funding for existing practices under the same sort of uh, EQIP, CSP, ASAP, and RCPP uh, programs that we have today. Just a caveat here to note a couple other uh, items in the IRA. Uh, there was additional funding for forestry as well. So there are forestry practices uh, as well that uh, have some potential credits. Uh, there is also unrelated to climate, but additional funding for some agricultural credit and some debt relief and assistance that actually sort of extends the authority and utilizes uh, new funding to go with old funding uh, from last year's American Rescue Plan. So. That's just to note, there are other agricultural provisions in the IRA. We fundamentally are talking about the climate provisions here today. Uh, the second big bullet there on that slide is remind, remind us that the IRA is not the only uh, component happening or not the only uh, effort happening today. Um, the secretary announced uh, originally back in February a commitment of about $1 billion for what was called climate smart commodities. Uh, using funding under the Commodity Credit Corporation. Ultimately, the secretary announced just uh, in the past few days that they have funded 70 projects for a total of 2.8 billion in funding uh, over the next few years. So substantial increases in funding, even through executive order, uh, even through administrative action uh, on climate uh, priorities as well. Now, all that said about new funding available and, and a certainly what appears to be new opportunities. The question remains, what is it and, and what gets what kinds of practices will work here? We don't we don't have a list today of the kinds of practices specifically that will be funded or not funded under the additional uh, funding here that goes for climate smart practices. What we do have, with some guidance at least, is an example of the kinds of climate practices that have been funded previously or currently in the Conservation Stewardship Program. There's a publication available online on the NRCS uh, webpage for the CSP program. You can link to it from there. It's a really long address. 
So the shorter address at NRCS, I've got posted there. More specifically, if you really want to go directly to the document, I created a short URL for it there. But that four-page document describes a number of practices. Those include many practices there on page one that you do see that are all about soil health. And those are some of the common practices that we've heard of and think about. Everything from uh, cover crops to, um, uh, to conservation tillage and, and other, other components as well. Nitrogen management or nutrient management in general uh, certainly is, is on that list as well uh, as you turn the page and you see more. Livestock partnership programs historically have related to uh, biomass or biogas uh, uh, fermentation facilities. The IRA talks about enteric fermentation. Uh, so whether it's a focus on capturing biomass you know, after the animal or whether it's a, a focus on uh, addressing the diet um, before um, uh, the, that's fed uh, that produces the enteric fermentation. Uh, there may be differences there, but fundamentally we see a lot of practices. Grazing and pasture management, uh, intensive grazing or, or managed hay and grazing, uh, agroforestry practices, land restoration practices where um, putting land aside, preserving it or, or restoring it may be the practice to, to help protect climate. Those are the broad categories that we see funded already. It's not unexpected or, or it would not be surprising to see those same broad categories be the target of the new funding uh, uh, in these programs via the IRA. Now, where does that leave a producer? And I'll leave it with, with this slide here uh, before I finish. Um, but we want to think about how we can help a producer make decisions about these uh, practices. Whether the goal is climate or whether the goal is economic efficiency or uh, maybe it's erosion control, maybe it's uh, uh, improved uh, management of, of water, water quality, et cetera. There can be multiple environmental reasons and benefits to adopting various practices. So one of the challenges for a producer will be to, to try and assess what's this practice worth to me in terms of benefits. And it might be economic in terms of efficiencies or increased productivity or sustaining productivity over time. It might also be non-economic and, and somewhat, uh, um, you know, what we would call utilitarian um, preferences and, and goals for maintaining a landscape or maintaining a, an operation. So don't forget benefits um, and, and broadly defining benefits and measuring them against costs. Uh, we, we can look at various resources that have been produced in, uh, from multiple outlets, um, cover crop uh, cost estimates or uh, other sorts of practices and looking at a benefit cost calculation here. So economics matter certainly. We'll see whether, the, whether these programs that are funded through IRA or the existing conservation program to provide substantial incentives, uh, payments for uh, adopting practices that may reward the practice uh, or may at least help offset the costs such that the other benefits help make the practice viable. Think of the incentive payments we've seen the last couple of years uh, for cover crop adoption, uh, whether it's payments or whether it is an incentive that essentially helps pay down the cost of crop insurance, uh, the, the kinds of incentive programs and the kinds that we may see roll out here with the IRA funding uh, will be an important part of the equation. And then of course the market, uh, what opportunities are there in the market? Trying to calculate the benefits includes potentially what are the potential returns from the market for uh, credits that we might earn through this process. Uh, and there is nothing specifically to say that the credits um, uh, or, or practices adopted through incentive programs that generate reductions may still be eligible to earn credits that can be sold in a market. Uh, that might sound like double dipping. Can you get paid for the credit that you, would, that you gained by virtue of adopting the practice that you were incentivized to, to adopt? But depending upon language, one would have to assess whether there is an opportunity to, in fact, benefit from the, the incentive uh, program and benefit from the credit that's effectively uh, earned accordingly. So do, do some careful economics. I point to our uh, Center for Ag Profitability website as a source 
It's not the only source, but it is a source of some great information, uh, particularly our carbon page at cap.unl.edu slash carbon. So you can find some, some previous publications and resources written there. Uh, you can look for more. You can also inquire about uh, potential resources as well. So that's where I'm going to leave it. And let me stop the share so that we can go back, Ryan, and let you pick it up and help moderate some, some discussion. All right, thank you, Brad. Thanks again, Dave. Um, Brad, I did get a question in, um, if you don't mind going back to the slide, where uh, there's just a question asking for some clarification on the uh, $2.8 billion commitment for Climate Smart yes. commodity uh, programs, if you could just clarify um, what that was in relation to the Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah, let me, uh, I'll go back to share this briefly here. So, and, sorry, Brad, we'll remind I'm everyone sorry. else, if you do have a question, you can enter that in the Q&A or the chat box, and uh, we've got a few minutes here to answer some of those. Great. Okay. Um, so, I will note, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, includes what adds up to approximately $18 billion of additional funding for the, the conservation programs uh, to provide incentive payments to producers. Uh, the... 2.8 billion that was just announced this past week, uh, or early this week, late last week, I think earlier this, no, late last week, I'd remember where I was when I read it. Uh, I was at Husker Harvest Days uh, reading some headlines and, and saw that this announcement had come out. Uh, USDA announced 2.8 billion for what they call Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities. That's funding for 70 different projects that range from university-led projects to major corporation-led projects to local nonprofit organization or other, you know, other stakeholder groups uh, being involved in projects that are designed to help develop, implement, and reward various climate uh, smart practices and, and thus commodities. So that's not 2.8 billion in payments necessarily, but some combination of research, development, implementation, coordination, and incentives uh, for producers um, are, are part of that announcement. Uh, more information on that is available on USDA's main website at usda.gov under recent news, but, uh, uh, but that essentially is, that's USDA making um, a uh, executive decision to move forward with funding for what they call climate smart commodities. So separate from IRA, but uh, closely related certainly in, in focus. And another question we got in, thank you, Brad, um, that may be good here at this time is somebody asking just how a producer can go about taking advantage of all the programs that you've described here, where to even begin. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. and and. As I showed that list of practices, that's a reminder just of what current programs already do. Uh, all of those climate practices on that long list are current CSP practices. So NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, is, is the agency due to roll out uh, the additional funding in those programs. Whether the new funding just goes for additional payments you know, new payments on, on existing practices, or whether there is a new slate of practices or some combination really remains to be seen. So I can't tell you exactly what the funding will pay for, um, uh, whether there will be new practices added to the list or and so forth. But regardless, whether it's the new opportunities or whether it's existing programs, that contact starts with uh, a local uh, conservationist at the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, so at your local USDA office. Um, that conservationist uh, can help you sort of assess conservation issues on the farm, build a plan to address them, and then help determine which program might offer assistance uh, and incentives to, to help you adopt those things. Great. Thank you, Brad. And um, Dave, in, in your slides, is it, can you just clarify, is there anything in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act about carbon credit sales. Um, we didn't think so. And then if, if you or you, Brad, want to chime in on this too, do either of you see an increase 
in the market demand for carbon credit sales by private companies? Okay, hey, I'll take the first stab at, at, at this. Uh, I didn't see anything in it. I, I, in terms of that would directly affect uh, ag carbon credit sales one way or the other. Uh, I did not get into the details on the ag on the ag side. I left that to Brad, so he may have found some stuff that I that didn't pop out to me. Um, but at a more general level, you know, regulating carbon emissions is what has, is, the, is the economic driver for these voluntary carbon markets. You know, Brad, Brad mentioned uh, restrictions in, in uh, California and uh, also the restrictions in the Northeast uh, U.S. where carbon emissions from industry, from power plants, these sorts of things are regulated. And in some of those states, you can make up a portion of your reduction requirements. You can make it through doing things like buying these carbon credits that have to be certified as being legitimate carbon credits, uh, you know, so that you don't have to clean up quite as much. Um, so I don't see anything in the uh, climate law that would do anything to really give a boost to um, to the current ag carbon credit markets. And Brad mentioned the uh, Security Exchange Commission uh, proceedings that are going on, uh, which if implemented in roughly the way that they were proposed, this could lead up to a tightening of reporting requirements saying, so if you're a major publicly traded corporation and saying we're reducing our carbon footprints, footprint, excuse me, by purchasing, among other things, these ag carbon credits, those ag carbon credits are gonna to have to meet standards in terms of measurement and verification that they do not have to meet in the voluntary market today. So there's, I mean, there's, there's, different straws in the wind uh, in terms of what's going on, but um, that those, uh, the SEC proceeding is a, and, and there's a parallel one uh, that's going on through the United Nations uh, that came out of the latest uh, international climate conference where they were trying to come up with international agreement on how do we, how do we count these uh, ag or land-based uh, carbon credits in the international uh, carbon credit credit uh, trading uh, scheme, and and so there's we may be going from a system that's pretty wide open uh, and freewheeling uh, to one that is more uh, buttoned down and tied down. Uh, so I mean, it's my crystal ball is very cloudy. Uh, but that seems to be uh, kind of where things are headed at today. I think, Dave, you 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 finished that exactly on on the point that I would have thought of is there's there's nothing in the IRA in its broad, you know, comprehensive nature, and ag is only part of that, and and the uh, the energy and and climate is only part of that overall bill. But there's nothing in the broad IRA that says um, we're going to build a, a, a trading market or, or a market for credits. Some of these climate smart commodity projects may in fact go further towards building some rigor and some uh, metrics for, for what markets might look like over time. But there's nothing in the IRA that says we're going to sort of force a market uh, to, to take place. Uh, sort of the adage is, as noted, it's, it's a lot easier to subsidize good behavior than it is to penalize bad behavior. Forcing a cap and trade type program or forcing a regulatory limit on emissions is not a bridge that, that, they've, uh, that they've touched yet. So the market opportunity remains either in those regional regulatory driven markets that are important but relatively small compared to the total, uh, or they're in the voluntary uh, markets at the moment. Uh, and 
the question going forward might be, does a, does a corporation or a major entity continue to be willing to pay dollars to incentivize practices that then can be recorded as credits and help offset their, their corporate emissions for, you know, for SEC reporting? Or do ultimately we see uh, supply chains mandate practices sort of as a, as a cost of doing business? Um, I, think, I think that's an important question for agriculture going forward is, can we be incentivized for these practices or will we essentially be mandated and not necessarily mandated by the government, but mandated by our, by our customers, by our, uh, uh, by our supply chain requirements? Uh, that's that's a question that we'll continue to have to watch and and evolve to over time. One one last comment. Uh, when we think of where emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, come from in the United States, you know, electricity and um, transportation are both right about twenty eight percent. So that's fifty. 56% between the two of them. Um, industry is uh, in the low 20s, uh, so that's 70 some. Um, agriculture is a little bit further down the list. Uh, I think it's about 10 or 11% of annual emissions. And that's not looking at, you know, what are the, uh, what are the carbon storage benefits that we get from production ag uh, or from, uh, forestry. I mean, if you look at that, then it's it's getting a lot closer to being a net, well, a very small number, maybe at two or three percent on a net basis. So, you know, the, infl the Inflation Reduction Act, the major focus is on, uh, the major climate focus is on what do we do to bring down the emissions in the electricity sector, and then the transportation sector, and ultimately in the uh, residential, commercial, and industrial sectors, uh, to try to, you know, bring our national emissions down closer to where uh, the international agreements and stuff um, want us to be. Um, and there's my take is, you know, there's not not a lot of ag in that climate part, because ag, contrary to what you hear from some climate activists, ag is not the big problem. Um, ag is, you know, an issue, uh, but it is not, we're not number one in cumulative greenhouse gas emissions because of agriculture, you know, far, far from that. So. Agriculture is more part of the solution than part of the problem, in my opinion. All right, very good. I want to thank you both, uh, Dave Aiken and Brad Lubin with our Center for Ag Profitability here. We do have to wrap it up now that we're close to 1 p.m. Central Time. A recording of today's webinar, though, will be available on our website, cap.unl.edu slash webinars. You can see there our upcoming schedule features a look at uh, planning ahead for hay purchases next week. And then the following Thursday, uh, Brad will be back on with some uh, representatives from the University, uh, excuse me, University of Missouri to look at Nebraska farm income and projections that lay ahead. So uh, I want to thank everybody again for attending our webinar today. And again, look for the recording at our website, cap.unl.edu. And uh, that should be up there by tomorrow afternoon. So with that, Brad, Dave, thank you very much and hope everybody has a great week. Thank you. Oh.